talk more about psychology of skiing, but also sort of psychology of uh, people. Jim, please. Can you have to take this? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. My left arm is getting tired holding the microphone. Um, and it's interesting, uh, usually when I speak to a group of parents, I'll give a talk like positive pushing because it focuses on being a good parent. Um, but so often I, I'm asked by parents, well, what, what do you talk about with the kids? Because you guys want to know what, what are the kind of things I do with the kids. So this is a great opportunity where um, I can take you through uh, my approach to the psychology of ski racing. So um, I'd like to start off uh, with some essential questions. First of all, um, how important is the mental side of ski racing compared to the physical and technical side? How important is the mental side? Let's take a little poll here. Raise your hand if you believe the mental side is less important than the physical and technical side of ski racing. Usually there's one or two people who have the courage to, to raise their hand, <laughs> considering what I do for a living. Um, raise your hand if you believe the mental side is as important as the physical and the technical side. Okay, you guys, how many think it's more important? Wow. Guys, for all of you who say believe it's more important, I appreciate it, but even as a sports psychologist, I don't believe it's more important. Because <laughs> you can have all the mental stuff in the world, but if you don't have the physical and technical capabilities to get from the start to the finish, the mental stuff doesn't matter. But it is an essential piece of the puzzle, and it is a neglected piece of the puzzle. I, I approach um, uh, um, uh, the mental side of ski racing the same way I approach the physical and technical side, that they are skills you develop with practice. And I'll emphasize that in a minute. And Think about how much time your kids devote to ski racing, the technical and physical side of ski racing, hours a day. Well, if the mental side is so important, are hours a day committed to the mental side of the mental preparation? No. Now, clearly, when at, when your race when your races are training, they are in fact doing a lot of mental stuff. But it, I believe that the mental side needs to be approached in an organized, systematic fashion. So when your kids go out on the hill, your co coaches say, "Oh, just take some runs and work on whatever." No they have a, a clear technical and tactical progression. Um, when your kids are doing physical conditioning, are they just sort of going in and lifting some weights randomly? No, they're on a, a structured, organized program. And the approach I take then is that the same way should happen with the mental side of the sport. The second question is, um, should peak performance be your goal? How many of you have heard the phrase peak performance? Yeah, can anybody define it for me? What's peak performance? When the stars align. When the stars align. When the stars align, okay. I like that. <laughs> Believing you're about to perform. Working in a progression to maximize your performance in a particular event. Well, wow, okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. And? Achieving your best performance. Achieving your best performance. Performing at your highest level. All those sound good. How many of you think uh, peak performance is a pretty good thing to strive for? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds pretty good to me, doesn't it? And when I come out of grad school, that's what I wanted the athletes I worked with to achieve. Because who wouldn't want to achieve peak performance? And peak performance has become a part of our achievement vocabulary. Um, it started in sports, and now you hear it in the business world. That's what everybody's striving for. But as I became more experienced as a psychologist and as a writer, I came to appreciate the power of words. And I decided that peak performance was not highly descriptive of what I wanted my athletes to achieve. So you tell me, what's wrong with peak performance? You can only once. There's only one little point. What else? What's that? What's timing of the peak? Timing. Okay, so you might peak a week early or a week late. And once you get to that peak, where can you go? There's only one way to go, and the definite by definition of peak, the, the drop is precipitous. So all of a sudden, peak performance doesn't sound like a great goal. Because if you think about what makes the great ones great, it's not their ability to have one great race. It's their, what makes them great is their ability to go out there on a regular basis and perform at a really high level. So I struggled for a couple of years trying to come up with a phrase that I thought was descriptive of what I wanted my athletes to achieve. And I tried to stay in the geographical domain. So I thought of Mesa performance or Butte performance, and, and those didn't quite work for me. And then one day, a number of years ago, I had this meeting of timing and readiness. And I was walking through in the, I went to a supermarket, and I was walking through the meat section. And I looked down at the schlab of beef, and there was a sticker on it, and it said, prime cut. Prime cut, and it's one of the light bulb of hot experiences. And I went back to my office and looked up the word prime. And it was defined as of the highest quality or value. Of the highest quality or value. I finally had my thing, prime performance, or in this case, prime ski racing. So here's my definition of prime ski racing. <coughs> Skiing at a consistently high level under the most challenging conditions. Skiing at a consistently high level under the most challenging conditions. Two important words in that definition. What's the first important word? Consistency. No, it's not. Oh, it's not one of <laughs> Consistency. Well, any, anybody can go out and perform well once. What makes the great ones great in ski racing, in any sport, is their ability to go out there day in and day out 
week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out, and perform at a consistently high level. You see it with Hersher, you see it with Bodie, with Ted, with uh, Michaela now, with Lindsay, with Maze. It's their consistency that's remarkable. Uh, Hersher didn't finish out of the top three in one World Cup small this year. It's a remarkable consistency. He, he, he didn't DNF in, 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 I'm not sure he DNF at all this year in, in, the, in the tech events. So consistency is important. Second important word in that definition. Challenging. Challenging. It's easy to go out on a day when it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit, when your, your kid's running sixth, when it's their favorite event, their favorite hill. Anybody can ski well under ideal conditions. What makes the great ones great is their ability to ski their best in the worst possible conditions. Tough hill, tough weather, tough snow conditions, um, really um, high level competition. That's the goal. That's the goal your kids should be striving for. Not peak performance, but prime ski racing. So can ski race, prime ski racing be learned? Well, a lot of people think that with the mental side of things, you either have it or you don't, and if you don't have it, you can't get it. But I believe that prime ski racing is about developing skills. And I, as I touched on earlier, it's just like physical and technical skills. Develop mental skills through, prep, prep, uh, through practice, through repetition. And my goal for young ski racers is to develop a mental toolbox. That, think of it this way. You're driving down the road and you get a flat tire. You pull over, you go to the trunk, no jack, no flat, no, t uh, no spare, no tire iron, no AAA, or in this case CAA, I guess, right? And what, what does that mean? It means you're stuck. But if you're going down the road, you get a flat tire, you pull over, go to the trunk, jack, spare, tire iron, fix it, get on your way. All the stuff I talk about is not for when things are going well. Because when things are going well, you, all these things are fine now. What all this stuff is about is when things aren't going well. And in, in, inevitably, in your child's ski racing life, in their life in general, they're going to have a lot of flat tires. And so the key then is to have the tools to pull out of that toolbox to fix them. The great thing about a metal toolbox, it's a metaphor. It doesn't weigh anything. So you, they can carry it on, on planes and, and up the hill without having to uh, increase their, their, their load. So what race are your kids competing in? Every time they get in the starting gate of a race, they're actually racing in three races. Anybody want to tell me what the most obvious race they're racing in is? The race race against the competitors. Yeah. That's the obvious one. Before they can win that race, there's two, there are two other races they need to win. What's the one just below that? What else are they competing against? Conditions. Not, not yet. The conditions, exactly. <clears throat> they're, they're racing against the course. And if you think about it, the course is trying to whoop your kids. It's throwing gates at them, it's throwing terrain at them, it's throwing snow conditions at them, it's throwing weather at them. It's, the course is doing everything it possibly can to beat your kids. So if your kids can't win the race against the course, there's no way they can win the race against their competitors. But even before that, there's another race they need to win. What's that? Themselves. Against themselves, the mental race. If your kids don't win the mental race, overcome all the mental challenges that are a part of ski racing, they can't win the race against the course, and they can't win the race against their competitors. So it ultimately starts with that race against themselves. So what are your kids preparing for? Well, two things. First, they're preparing for every day. Going back to that idea of consistency. Every day, whether training or racing, going out and performing at a high level. Skiing consistently well. But ultimately what they're preparing for is what I call prime time. And this is that one big race a year. And there might be a couple of prime time races during the course of the year if they qualify for bigger and bigger events. Where it's the most difficult course, the most challenging conditions, the toughest competitors, the biggest race of their life. Everything your kids are working toward is ultimately directed toward preparing them to ski their best in prime time. So that's the value of training, of dryland conditioning, of video, everything they do is directed to that moment the biggest race of their life, they're, they get in the gate, and they're prepared to ski their fastest. Now, the problem with the psychological side of sport is you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't measure it directly. It's easy in terms of, let's say, conditioning. Well, how much weight can you bench press? How fast can you run a 40 in? What's your vertical jump? You can see the numbers. Um, doing video, you can see technique. The problem with the mental side is, these mental concepts, everybody knows they're, everybody knows they're important, but, but like, what exactly are they? And how can I wrap my arms around them? Because right now, without a real foundation, there are all these mental things just sort of floating around in space or inside our brains. So what I've done is I've developed a framework, what I call the Prime Ski Racing Pyramid. 
It is composed of the five mental factors that I believe are most essential for ski racing success. And by the way, this applies to all sports. This applies to school. I use this with surgeons, with lawyers, with business people. Because for me, I'm a big believer that performance is performance. Whether it's ski racing, sport, business, whatever, requires many of the same qualities. Also, these five areas are ordered in a very specific fashion. From the lower ones, the upper ones come. So for example, um, if you have somebody who's really motivated, they're going to be well prepared. If they're well prepared, they're going to be more confident. If they're more confident, they're less likely to get nervous. If they're less likely to get nervous, they're going to be more focused. And if they're highly focused, then their emotions are going to work with them rather than against them. So what I'm going to do for the rest of my time with you this morning is explore these five areas. Now, another thing I want to mention is that, that even though I have a pretty strong academic background in terms of research and, and so on, I'm, I'm very much about making things practical. And so what I'm going to be doing here is offering you in the section called Take Action a lot of tools that kids can put in the toolbox. And, and so the idea is that mental stuff is not just this sort of, oh yeah, mental stuff is important, but here's some things you can do, just like a, a physical conditioning program, just like technical and tactical work. So motivation. I'm really big into definitions. Again, as a writer, I believe in the power of words, and it's very important that the words we use, that we have a shared vocabulary. So when I talk about motivation, you understand what I'm talking about. So I'm going to provide definitions for all of these. The determination and drive to achieve your goals. Pretty obvious stuff. So why is it important? Well, first of all, motivation is everything. It's the foundation of everything. It's why it's on the bottom of the pyramid. Because without motivation, nothing else matters. Motivation is what gets your kids out of bed in the morning, gets your kid out on the hill, it gets your kids um, working hard and struggling against all the things that ski racing presents. Another interesting thing about motivation is, is the connection between effort and goals. When I speak to a group of young athletes, young, young racers, I say, how many of you have big goals? How many, how many, how many hands do you think go up? All of them, enthusiastically. For young ski racers, I want to make the provisional team, the, uh, the Canadian team, go to the Olympics, win Olympic gold medal, medal, whatever. Very big goals. But then I ask, how many of you are doing everything you possibly can to achieve your goals? How many hands do you think go up? Not too many, maybe two, one or two, kind of like part way up, because nobody's willing to make that commitment. This is a real problem here, if there's a disconnect between effort and goals. Now, so, in the, here's the situation. Effort, goals. There are two options here. What are the two options? Okay, raise, raise the effort or lower the goals. There's no right or wrong answer. If somebody doesn't want to strive for big goals, that's fine. But if they have those big goals, they need to make sure that their effort is consistent with it. And the thing about young athletes is, is they don't always know what that effort, big effort means. Because they see the stars on the World Cup, but they don't know how incredibly hard they work. So a big part of helping young racers become the best they can be is helping them understand what it takes. And so I'm a big believer in educating kids about what it takes to become a great ski racer. So it's really important to make sure that kids' efforts are consistent. Because if they're not, there's no way, assuming the goals are high, there's no way they can possibly achieve them. Next thing is the thing that I developed a couple years ago called the grind. Now, no matter how much your kids love to ski race, they're going to get to a point where it's no longer fun. It's hard, it's frustrating, it's boring, it's tiring, it's painful, it's cold. I'd rather be doing something else right now. Now, when most people reach the grind, what do they do? They, they give up, they quit, they ease up. But what makes the great ones great is they recognize that line of the grind and they say, this is when it starts to matter. This is when I'm going to separate myself from other racers who they hit the grind and they stop. So, you know, so often I hear kids say, oh, it's so, it's so cold out, I'm so tired, I just want to go in. That's when it really matters. And I think this is really important to talk to kids about because they don't know, they don't know that line. And it's a great tool you can use, a great tool your coaches can use when they're working, when, it, when it's getting to be hard and things are tough out there. Say, guys, this is the grind. You have a choice now. We're going to keep plowing ahead and separating ourselves from everybody else because most people, most kids do quit, do give up when it's hard. Or are we just going to be like everybody else? And that ties in very much with that connection between effort and goals. Because if they, if, they, if they grind through the grind, if you will, that means the effort stays high or goes higher, and that means it connects with their goals and they have a better chance of achieving their goals. So, what can you do to take action? First, it's interesting. I think there's one place that your kids should focus on their long-term outcome goals, and that's in training. 
Just think of it this way. They're out on the hill, and it's really cold, and they're tired, and the course is all chewed up, and their, body, their body's telling their mind, it's time to quit. And if the mind listens to the body, they're going to quit. But the mind needs to tell the body that there's a reason why we're out here. There's a reason why this is so hard. And so by thinking, okay, my goal is to make the provincial team this year, or qualify for junior nationals, or whatever it might be. By focusing on that long-term outcome goal, it does a couple things. It gives the body a reason to keep to stay out there suffering. It also generates a bunch of positive emotions, which reduce feelings of pain, feelings of discomfort, and it keeps their motivation going. So that idea of when things are hard, that's when your kids need to remember why they're out there. Second, have a training partner or training group. No matter how hard your kids work alone, and this is often in dryland training, they will work that much harder if they have somebody they train with or a training group that works together to push each other. No highly successful athlete is able to become successful in a vacuum. They do it with support from parents, from coaches, from teammates. So having somebody there or a group of people that they train with where they, they support each other, where they're positive, where they help each other, that lifts all the boats. That will motivate them. Have you guys ever hung out with um, really downer people? Yeah, what happens? You can just get sucked down to that, into that dark hole. But you hang out with people who are passionate and intense and motivated, you can't help but lift up. It's hard to be lazy and unmotivated when everybody else around you is working really hard. You guys probably know that from work. Third thing is, I, I don't like athletes to spend a lot of time thinking about their competitors, because if they're thinking about their competitors, they're not thinking about themselves. But there is a place for it. And I often ask racers when I speak to them as a group, um, how many of you have somebody who you really want to kick their butt this year? And they all raise their hand. And, and I say, can somebody give me an example? And then some of them will just point to the person next to them, their friend next to them. <laughs> and others will say, oh, it's this other person at this other club. And I say, well, how many, uh, are they working hard? And they go, yeah. And you really want to beat them? Yeah. So what do you think you need to do to beat them? Well, I need to work that little bit harder. And so that, that provides a little incentive as well. And sometimes the athletes I work with, they'll put a picture of a competitor um, up on their wall or put their name. It's a constant reminder. Oh, yeah, this is why I'm working hard. This is, this is why I'm, I'm putting the time. Ultimately, so I, I can help ski racers maintain their motivation in the short term, like when they're having a hard day of training or they're in the gym and they're in a lot of pain. But motivation is one of the few things that I can't really impact long term. Ultimately, your kids need to ski race for the right reasons. They need to want to be out there. And one of those reasons is not to make you happy, as I talked about in my previous talk. They need to be out there for their own reasons. Now, there are a lot of different reasons to ski race. Because they love to win, they love to compete, they love being with their friends, they love to ski, they love the mastery of, of, of the sense of accomplishment of, of mastery of becoming better. But they need to get in touch with that. I think, I think it's a really great conversation to have with your kids. Like, why do you ski race? That's one of the first questions I ask when I work with kids. Because I want to know what drives them. And if nothing drives them, well, maybe ski racing is not the sport for them. Maybe just skiing. Maybe not skiing at all. I don't know. But if, if kids don't compete for the right reasons, ultimately it's going to come back and, and they're going to pay a price for it. Or you're going to pay a price for it. Um, from John claude Keeley, preparation is everything to winning. It's easy to say I'm going to win. It's much more, uh, it's got deleted. It's much more difficult to do the work to win. So confidence. How strongly you believe in your ability to achieve your goals. Now, it's interesting because even though motivation is the bottom of the pyramid, I actually think the confidence is the most important mental factor. Because you can have, your kids can have all the ability in the world to get down the hill fast, but if they don't believe in that ability, they're not going to use that ability. Ski racing is a sport of risks. You can have somebody ski really nicely, really pretty, but if they're not going fast, they're not getting a good result. Um, do they get style points in ski racing? No, of course not. It's all that matters is the time on the board. And so, your kids aren't going to take the risks if they don't have the confidence, if they don't believe that those risks will pay off. Another thing, as I touched on earlier, confidence is a skill. A lot of people think, well, I've always been kind of negative, not really had a lot of confidence myself, so that's just the way I am. It's not true. 
I had my own experience as a ski racer. When I was younger, I had so little confidence in my ability to, to go fast. And I almost did pretty well despite myself. And the way I think I fell in love with, with sports psychology was that I, I took a summer class uh, at a college and um, related to all this stuff. And I applied all the things that I'm talking about to you today and some other things to my ski racing. And I took a quantum leap in my ski in terms of I made the bottom of the ski team, um, top five in every slum I was in, except US, US Nationals, unfortunately, I haven't picked yet. Um, I finished at 75% uh, of my races. But the biggest thing for me at, at that time was that next year, when I got the starting gate, I not only knew I was gonna finish, I knew I was gonna win. I developed, through all these techniques that I, I'm talking about, this really profound confidence in my ability. Now, did I win every time? Of course not. But, but I, I had a breakthrough year, and I attributed it entirely to all these things that I talk about, and, and fundamentally, in this profound new confidence that I had in myself. Confidence challenge. It's easy to be positive and confident when things are going well. These are things are going well. Confidence challenge is your kid's ability to stay positive and confident and motivated when things aren't going well. When things aren't going well, whether it's tough conditions or not skiing well, most kids are going to go to the dark side. They're going to start saying things like, I can't do this, this is terrible, I hate this, what am I doing here? But the great ones, they get in those conditions, and they stay positive. Okay, things aren't going well here, but I'm going to keep at it. I'm going to keep working hard. So, taking action. A lot of practical things you can do for, uh, for confidence. One, the foundation of all confidence is preparation. When I start working with athletes, and as an example, I, I worked with a couple of athletes in London last summer, uh, leading up to London. And uh, I started with them about a year before. And one of the first things I said was this. Your goal, when you get to the line, is they're endurance athletes, when you get to the line is to be able to say this, I'm as prepared as I can be to achieve my goals. I'm as prepared as I can be to achieve my goals. Does that guarantee success? No. The nature of ski racing is just stuff happens, despite how pre preparation. And so your goal with your children <coughs> is that they've done everything they can to be ready. If your kids aren't prepared, as prepared as they can be, I have no sympathy for them. Because that is one thing that they have control over. Bad weather, a rut in a hole in a course, those things happen. But preparation is one thing that they have control over. So making sure that they're, that they're prepared. Mental toolbox. If your kids have a lot of tools in their toolbox, when they get the flat tire, they're not going to go, oh my gosh, I'm stuck here, what do I do? They're going to go, I have the tools, I can fix it. So they get to the start, and they're a little nervous. Well, they have tools to calm themselves down. They lose focus. They have things to get refocused. They start to get frustrated. I have some, they have some tools to deal with frustration. The more tools they have to fix problems that arise, the more confident they're going to be. Adversity. This is one of my favorites. Most kids, when they get into tough conditions, they go, oh, this is terrible, this is so hard, I hate this. How many of your kids love to be the first one on a training course when it's hero snow? Love it. How many of your kids um, start under those conditions in races? Very few of them, probably. How many kids, and the coaches will attest to this, they did yesterday, how many kids, when the course starts to get rough, they say, hey coach, can you Well, for, for kids starting in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that's when they should start training. <clears throat> but adversity is a mindset, because everybody has tough conditions. I've never been in a ski race where it was only 30 below zero on me. I've never been in a ski race where the course was only chewed up for me. Of course, the start number is affected there. I've, I've never been in a, in, in a race where it was only foggy for me. Now, admittedly, weather can change too. Everybody has those conditions. So one really powerful way to build confidence in racers is to expose themselves to adversity and train them. And train them, prepare them for that adversity. Because if they, if they train in really bad conditions, two things happen. They demonstrate themselves that they're capable of dealing with the adversity, and also they develop specific tools to succeed in the adversity. So if it's a really ruddy course, well, they can't ski straight. So what can they do? Well, they learn to sit up a little higher and ski a little wider line. So when they get to the race, how's their confidence going to be? I've trained in these conditions. I know how to deal with them. Adversity is a wonderful place to build confidence. Success. You can do all the other stuff to build confidence. But if your kids don't experience success, it can go for naught. But when I talk about success, a lot of people think, well, you mean like a big win or a great result. But I believe that those big wins, those big victories, aren't possible without confidence. And so you first need to build the confidence. But, but then I'm saying, well, to build confidence, you need to have successes.
But when I talk about that, I'm not talking about the victor, big victories. I'm talking about the little victories. Every day your kid comes out of the weight room and worked hard and got a little bit stronger. Every time they, they had a great day of training on the hill, they just had a little victory. And what happens is every day they get all these little victories, and what do they add, add up to? A lot of confidence, which leads to the big victory. So giving them those opportunities to succeed. Lastly, self-talk. Again, self-talk is a skill. Think of it this way from a technical perspective. If your kids in, in Slalom are constantly dropping their hands, what are they becoming good at? Dropping their hands. And so what's going to come out in a race? Dropping their hands. Same thing with self-talk. If your kids in training are constantly saying, oh, I hate this, this stinks, I'm not, I suck, you, have to, you hear that all over the place, I'm terrible, I can't do this, what are they becoming good at? Being negative. So what's going to come out in a race? Being negative. So self-talk is a skill that develops with practice. Now, when I talk about self-talk, I don't mean when things are going badly saying, oh, I'm having fun out here, or I'm having a great time, or I'm loving this. That's just unrealistic. They're not going to believe that. But there are ways to be positive, saying things like in, tough, in a tough situation, you know, I'm going to keep working hard, I'm going to stay positive, I'm going to do my best, I'm not going to give up. That's positive self-talk. Because with that negative stuff, they're basically giving up, they're surrendering. And what happens 100% of the time when somebody gives, a young racer gives up? They lose. They have no chance of success. But if they keep trying, keep fighting, keep going, keep believing, then they have at least a shot at success. From Lindsey Vaughn, of course I have my moments, but it's usually easier and more fun to be positive than it is to be negative, and it has served me well. And it's obviously served her very well. Let's talk about intensity. I define intensity as the amount of physiological activity racers feel before and during races. So one thing to keep in mind is that we are physical beings. We, we can have all the mental stuff in the world, but if we're not physically capable of getting down the hill as fast as we can, if we're not in a physiological state where our body can perform at its highest level, your kids are not going to ski their best. So the way I think about intensity, well, here, here's the interesting thing. Early research in this area used the phrase anticipatory arousal. Now, I learned early in my career, don't use the word arousal with, little kid, with, with, with young teenagers. <laughs> so we'll take that out. Um, then in the, in the research in sports psychology, started using the, the word anxiety. Well, I don't like the word anxiety at all because, well, nobody wants to experience anxiety. So I came up with the, the, the term intensity. And you can think of intensity as a continuum. At one end of the continuum is really low intensity, like, sh like sleep. At the other end of the continuum is really high intensity, like sheer terror. Somewhere between sleep and sheer terror, your kids ski their best. But there's no one ideal level of intensity. You think of racers like, um, like a Benny Reich, like a Maze. Um, they ski relatively low body, pretty low intensity. Others kind of medium, like a, uh, like a Ted or a Lindsay. And then really high intensity would be like a Manfred Pronger or a um, 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 oh, Julie Mancuso. They ski best really intense. It's a great YouTube video. Um, um, go on YouTube and do a search for Manfred Pronger. There's a video of him where, there's a video, he's in the start of a, of, of, a, of a World Cup, and the video is like this, and I don't speak German, but he's standing there working himself into a frenzy going, come on, I'm gonna go, we got a second, right, right, like this. And so he just needs to get himself in this really intense state. So, uh, so one of the key goals for your kids is to first of all figure out what their ideal intensity is. And when I get on snow with kids, this is one of the biggest things I do, is I have them experiment. I have them take some runs really relaxed, kind of some kind of medium fired up, and some really intense. And have them see what happens to their skiing? Well, you know, when I'm, when I'm really relaxed, I, I have no energy, I can't create angles, the, 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 the hill knocks me around a lot. Um, when I get really intense, I feel like I've got, I'm too stiff and I have no agility and I lose my quickness and I just seem to become really uncoordinated. So, but, but when I'm sort of medium fired up, boy, that's when I feel really good. And that's just one example. There are others in, in each situation where, where some, some, a US ski team athlete I worked with last year, she thought she skied best, <coughs> um, pretty relaxed, but I had her amp it up some, increase her intensity, and all of a sudden, <coughs> she found that she was more aggressive, she had more energy, she could just generate more forces. <coughs> so the goal then is for your athletes, your kids, to monitor and adjust their intensity. So they get to the start of a course, they get to the start before a race, and they go, okay, so where's my intensity? 
Well, if they're too nervous, before they'd be going like, I'm really nervous, what do I do? But then they have tools to lower their intensity, or to amp it up, or to stay right where they are. Their goal is that every single training race run, they're at the same level of intensity that enables them to be physiologically prepared to ski their best. So what, what can they do? First of all, whole other workshop, but developing a pre-race routine. One of the key purposes of a pre-race routine is to ensure that they're physiologically prepared to ski their best. And that has to do with a good physical warm-up, and it has to do with either psyching up or psyching down. Another are psych down and psych up techniques. <clears throat> so if somebody is too nervous, they need to psych down. And that could include, involve breathing. It could involve um, muscle relaxation, shaking out their muscles. It could, it could involve listening to music. Music has a profound effect on us physiologically and emotionally. The coach as well. And what the coach says as well. I Very have, good point. I have the honor of being coached by one of the best coaches in the world that does that. Okay, good. Glenn Wirtel. Mm -hmm. And so what, what the coach does at the start, what you say at the start, hey, do, you, your kid's in the starter and you're skiing by and you say, hey, win this one. Not a great thing to do for intensity, that's for sure. Or for focus for that matter. And so the coach can also understand their athletes and do things to help their, their kids get ready at the start. Um, lastly, one of the craziest techniques I came across was when somebody is, is, is too intense is to get them to smile. Um, and I was working with the U.S. ski team athlete a number of years ago, and she was having a lousy day. Couldn't finish. Her coach was yelling at her. She was hating life. She sees up and he said, Doc, help me here. <laughs> and at first I was thinking, like, I have no idea what to do. But then I had this epiphany. epiphany. I said, smile. She said, I don't want to smile. I said, smile. She says, look, I'm having a lousy day. I don't want to smile. I said, smile. So she goes like this. And I said, stay like that. And over the course of about two minutes, it was this unbelievable physiological transformation where all the tension ran out of her body, she lost that frustration, that anger, and she became really relaxed. Do you know what my first thought was? Boy, I'm good at what I do. No. <laughs> no, my first thought was like, whoa, what's up with this? So, I, so I went, after the day of training, and, and she went back <clears throat> and finished the day of training and ended up having a really good day. So I went back after and did a little research, and I learned two things about smiling. First of all, as we grow up, we become conditioned to, to what smiling means. And what does smiling mean? What? Um, yeah, that we're happy, things are good. Also, there's been some fascinating neurochemical research that has shown that when we smile, it releases endorphins, our body's natural re relaxants. You should try this sometime when you're frustrated or angry about something. Force yourself to smile. Going back to that notion that we're fundamentally physiological beings, we can't think and feel ways that are inconsistent with what our body's telling us. So if, so if we're going like this, it's hard to be angry and frustrated. People think you're a little crazy, too, which is always a good thing. <laughs> um, from Darren Rawls about Bodie Miller. The kid, you just watch him. He makes so many mistakes, but he hauls ass. He is a guy who skis best, oddly enough, really, really relaxed. You see him at the start. He's just chilling, taking deep breaths, pretty darn low key. Focus. Focus is probably the most misunderstood psychological factor. Most people think of focus as this. Focus on one thing really hard. Now that might work if you're an Olympic shooter, but in ski racing there are all kinds of things you have to focus on. And there are all kinds of distractions out there pulling the focus away. The focus is probably most essential for training. Because I have a simple progression. An athlete, and for an athlete to, to really ingrain a skill, they need to focus on it. If, because if they focus on it, they'll work on it. If they work on it, they'll learn it. If they learn it, they'll be able to ingrain it and use it in a race. So I define focus as to concentrate on things that help performance and avoid distractions that hurt performance. So, why is it important? First of all, quality training. This is one of the biggest things I spend time with the racers on is, what can you do every single turn, every single run, every single day, to get the most out of your training. And the single biggest thing they can do is to maintain focus every single turn. <coughs> but ski racing is, is very difficult when it comes to focus. Um, let's think of golf. How many of you guys are golfers? Okay, it, I don't want to devalue golf as the most psychological of sports, but when it comes to basic focus, it's relatively easy to focus. The ball's sitting there, it's not moving, it's not gonna hit me in the head. So I'm able to say, let's say I'm working on my shoulders. I'm able to stay pretty focused, shoulders, 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 through my swing. Not that difficult. But, ski racing is a whole other story. Your child can be in the gate and they're totally focused on, let's say, keeping their hands up. Keep their hands up, keeping their hands up. They push out of the gate, all of a sudden there are a lot more important things to think about than keeping their hands up, like survival, <laughs> like making it down the course. <laughs> and, and the bottom line is, as soon as that focus is lost, they stop working on what they're working on. 
So not only are they not improving, but they're also getting worse because every time they do something the wrong way, they're ingraining in their motor cortex the wrong way of doing it, which makes it harder to do it the right way. So the goal is for quality training is every single turn, what can you do to keep their focus in their mind on what they're working on every single time? Consistent race performance. There's no way your kids can race consistently if they don't maintain consistent focus. And whether it's uh, kids telling this all the time, they're going on a race course and they start thinking about, oh, like what's for dinner? Or, oh, there's my mom on the side of the course. As soon as that happens, they've lost focus. Or they slide low on a gate. And they go, oh my gosh, I blew that turn. It takes them three or four gates to get back. Going again, to get to regain their focus. The goal, again, every turn, totally focus. Must be realistic. Your kid's going to lose focus. But a big part of, of, of learning the focus factor is not only maintaining focus, but regaining focus. So they slide low, and this is what the World Cupers do so well. They slide low, but instantly they go. They get it right back, and so they have one bad turn instead, instead of turning it into four. And last important issue is outcome versus process focus. Outcome focus for me is kiss of death. And yet, we live in a culture that, that are all about results. And you know, you can get results on the internet. Live timing is one of the worst things in the world for parents and, and, and their kids. I've seen parents who are in the other part of the world, and right after the kids run, they're calling them up because they were following the run on live timing. And think about this, that as I mentioned in the earlier talk, that when you focus on the outcome, it occurs at the end, and they're not focusing on the process. The only time your kids should think about the out outcome is, as I mentioned before, that when they're, in the tra when they're in training, they need that to remind themselves of why they're doing it. I don't believe you should ever talk about results with your kids. If they bring up, bring up results, oh my gosh, I've got to qualify for this, I've got to get these points, or I just did this, just say, okay, so what do you need to do to do that? Always talk about the process. You want your kids to get the results that they want? Always talk about the process. If you do that, they have a better chance of getting those results. So, take an action. What can you do to help kids improve their focus? First of all, mental imagery, a whole other workshop. The most powerful mental tool there is. If your kids have big goals and they're not on a consistent on-snow and off-snow mental, mental training program, they are not doing everything they possibly can to be the best they can be. And I talked earlier about how I took this big leap this, that, that, after taking that summer course. One of the project, the final project for that summer course was to do an imagery program on some area you wanted to improve on. So three times a week, all through the summer, I started doing imagery, seeing myself in gates. And here's the powerful thing about imagery. I couldn't make it three or four gates in my head without hooking a tip. What's up with this? Imagery, you should be able to just imagine whatever you want. But imagery actually taps into our unconscious. And I unconsciously had very little confidence in my ability, as I mentioned. So over the course of several months, then I kept it going through the fall. I'd force myself around the gate, preventing myself from hooking a tip. Until after about a month or two, I could finally run a course in my head without hooking a tip. And that next year, as I indicated, breakthrough year, it enabled me, that was one technique that had a huge impact on me. So imagery is a very powerful tool for focus. Because also, by the way, to, to, uh, to do imagery, you have to be able to focus. To imagine yourself running a whole, your kids running a whole course, you have to stay focused. And I found very often that the ability to focus improves greatly simply by doing imagery because you have to spend 60 seconds seeing themselves running a course. Um, just like with, with intensity, pre-race routines are really valuable with respect to, uh, to focus. And in fact, the two key areas that need to be established before a race is focus and intensity. And so here's a little, a little way to think about it. Um, focus style. Two types of focus styles. One focus style is what I call an internal focus style. And that's where racers uh, are before the start and the start area, they're totally focused on the race, they're not looking around, they're not talking to people, they're totally into getting there, getting prepared. Because if they open their focus really wide and talk to people, it just distracts them. These are kids who want to be away from the start area, away from the activity. Other focus style is what I call an external focus style. And this is somebody before a race, the last thing they want to do is focus on the race. So they're the ones who are, their focus is really wide, they're goofing around, they're talking, they're listening to music, they're, keep, they're doing anything but think about the race. 
Julie Mancuso is a great example of this. And then, but of course, a race or two before, then they bring the focus in. Because if they, if they bring the focus like this too early, they start thinking and doubting and questioning and critiquing, and their gears start grinding, and you can almost see smoke coming out their ears. So the last thing they want to do is think. So building that in the pre-race routine is important as well. Keywords. This is so valuable for training. Your coach gives your kids some feedback, a couple sentences of, of how to do something. When your kid's in the gate, when your kid's in the course, there's no possible way they can focus on those sentences of instruction. So what I, I encourage the coaches to do is after a bit of feedback, break, their, their, break the instruction down to one simple active keyword that they can say to themselves. And when, I, when I'm on the hill working with kids, I'll actually have them going down free skiing. Let's say um, they're working on keeping their hands up. And a good keyword might be up, or drive, or forward. And so they're literally going down the hill, up, up, saying it out loud, up, up. Because the idea is that they're trying to get them to pay attention to themselves. So let's say I wanted to get this, this fellow to pay attention to me. Would I go, I want you to pay attention to me. No. Would I go, hey, pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. So in a way, by saying it out loud, it forces kids to pay attention to themselves, meaning focus on the thing that they're working on. And if they're focused on it, then they're more likely to do it. Really powerful tool, both in, in uh, free skiing initially, then in gates. Three Ps. This is just a good way to approach um, the process of, of developing a good focus. I actually have a talk called the 14 Ps of Performance Psychology. Ps are a very popular word in, in the field for some reason, an important letter. Um, but in terms of focus, three Ps. The first is positive. Have your kids focus only on positive things. Second is process. Have your kids focus on what they need to do to ski well. Third P is present. Now, so many kids, they're worried about the past or they're worried about the future. There's a saying that you can't change the past, but you can ruin a perfectly good future worrying about it. One of the most basic things I say to kids before a race, before training, is what do you need to do now? And that's, that's positive because it, think, it focuses on things that will help them ski well. It's process because I'm talking about what do you need to do, and it's present. Now, what do you need to do now? The goal, again, is that every time they get in the gate, actually every time they get on snow, every turn they make, they're totally focused on skiing their best. Because an interesting thing, the goal for me is that I get athletes to think a lot. The goal of which is when they get in the gate, they don't have to think at all. They can just be and ski their best. From Peekaboo Street, old school. The whole vibe of skiing is not so much focusing on competition against others as it is against myself and the clock. Last, the top of the pyramid. I just added this a few years ago because I came to see that emotions ultimately seem to dictate how well people ski on race day and how well they ski in terms of their consistency. I define emotions as intense states that arise in response to situations that influence thoughts and behavior. Of all the definitions, this is the one I struggled with. Went online, couldn't find a decent definition of emotions. Well, we all know what emotions are. So let's explore this. What are all, and I guess we addressed this in the earlier talk, what are some common emotions your kids experience every day in training? And again, we talked about frustration, despair, anger, sadness. We also talked about pride, inspiration, excitement, and joy. Why emotions are so powerful is because they impact our psychology and our physiology. So physiologically, when we're angry, what happens to our body? Gets tense up, we hold our breath. Can we ski well that way? No. When we're sad, what happens to us physiologically? We lose all our intensity. Psychologically, when you're afraid, lose confidence, have doubt. When we despair, we lose motivation, lose focus, and again, we lose intensity. So helping kids to gain control of their emotions will help them psychologically and physiologically, which will then enable them to ski their best. Another key thing about emotions is <laughs> kids' emotional reactions to race situations. And, and two common ones <coughs> are course holds. I see so many kids, they're about to go, there's a fall, course hold, they freak out. It's like, I'm ready to go, come on, I'm ready to go. And they get all flustered, and they don't know what to do. Do they stand here? Do they pick on the ski? I don't know what to do. They freak out. And how do they ski that run? Generally not very well. 
So getting kids in those situations, Bodie Miller's great at this. I saw him at World Cup a couple of years ago. It was a like 10, 15 minute haul. All he does is back away, take off his skis, and just hang out. Just nothing, just fine, just hanging out. Comes back to it, puts on his skis, has a great run. Or making mistakes. Kids make a mistake on course, they get frustrated, they get angry, they go, oh my gosh, this is, I just blew my run, it's, I'm done. And as I touched on earlier, what was one mistake turns into a five-gate mistake. And the fact is, if you look at the best ski racers in the world, they make, they make mistakes all the time. But they get it right back. They don't let it affect them emotionally. If anything, it gets them fired up and they attack even more. So what, what can you do? Help your kids, first of all, figure out their emotional style. Now, I will, I will say this. This is entirely unscientific. These are four styles that I came up with that sort of characterize four basic ways. Um, the rager, the seether, the brooder, and the zen master. The rager is, is a kid who, when they get upset, they just explode. How many of you have kids like that? One hand? Okay, how many? And then there's the seether. When it keeps it and keeps it in, they explode. Got a hand there? Okay. Um, the brooder is one who uh, just keeps it and keeps it in and sort of eats them alive. Okay, good. And then the Zen Master. Any, any of you have Zen Master kids? You have one? Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. They're probably just born that way. And so helping kids understand their style. How do they, how do they react in emotional situations? And then to recognize hot buttons. What are the situations that set kids off? And so a classic example is in training, they can't seem to get something. They get really, really frustrated. Or um, they, they get really nervous before a start of a race. Or they start to, to worry a lot before uh, in some really difficult conditions. Because if, from that hot button situation, you can then help your kids develop a plan when that arises. So you get frustrated. Well, here are some things you can do. You start to get a little afraid or a little anxious before you start. Well, do some imagery, take some deep breaths, listen to some, some enjoyable music. It goes back to that idea of that toolbox. Threat versus challenge. This is a fascinating one for me. If I had to break everything I talk about, everything that separates really successful athletes from those who aren't, is the simple distinction between threat and challenge. A threat. When somebody's threatened by something, what happens physiologically? Three things. They hold their breath, their muscle tighten up, and they sit back. They sit back. Also, when somebody's threatened by something, what direction do you want to go? You want to run away. Exactly. Psychologically, motivation, run away. Confidence, down. Intensity, up. Focus, gone. All the things necessary to succeed, physiologically and psychologically disappear. That's threat. Challenge. When you're challenged by something, what direction do you want to go? You want to go at that thing. What happens physiologically? Adrenaline, excitement. Psychologically. Motivation? Bring it on. Confidence? I can do this. Intensity? Good. Focus? Laser beam. All the things necessary <laughs> to overcome that challenge are present. But here's the thing. This is not about reality. It's about perception. Two athletes of equal ability. Racer A, racer B. They get to the hill, really tough conditions, really cold, windy, bulletproof snow. Racer A says, oh my gosh, this is horrible, I hate this, what am I going to do? The other one says, I'm training in this, bring it on. Threat, challenge. Equal ability, who's going to be more success, most successful? Clearly, <laughs> the one who sees it as the challenge. And this is something I encourage the coaches yesterday, I encourage you guys to think about, talk to your kids about, because they don't think about these things. It's all, the same conditions apply. What is going to help you achieve your goals? And the interesting thing is, with threat reaction, it actually increases the chances that your kids will not succeed at the thing that they want to be most successful at. So that they're, in a way, setting themselves up for failure. So can they view the situation, however difficult it is, as a challenge? And then the four keys to emotional mastery. <laughs> I touched on this earlier in my positive pushing talk. Step, step back from the situation, get some emotional and physical distance, settle down physiologically, identify the problem, and find a solution. Your kids will experience this almost, this almost every day with frustration and training. Frustration is one emotion. It's the single greatest obstacle to your kid improving. Because improving is hard. Improving takes time. Improving is not easy. 
So the natural reaction is to get frustrated. And then, so the question is, is, is frustration a good or a bad emotion? Well, most will say it's a bad emotion, but it actually starts out as a good one. Because when you're frustrated, you're motivated to clear the path toward your goal. You're, you're, you're motivated to figure out the source of the problem that's causing the frustration. But typically, when, you, when kids are frustrated, they simply do more of the same harder. That violates the law of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting different results. So the best thing when a kid is frustrated is not to have him get right back to the next run and try it again. Have him step back. Free ski run, talk to friends, get something to drink, get something to eat, create that distance. If that calms themselves down. Then talk to the coach and say, Coach, I can't make this gate. I can't make this hairpin. And the coach said, Well, it's because you're you're not setting up the gate before. Well, you, well okay, you get, that means you're coming in too late. Well, there's the problem. The solution is set up a little bit more on the gate before and get, get up a little higher. Solution solved, problem solved, go back on the course, not frustrated anymore, has a way to solve the problem, more likely to be successful. For Michaela, there were a lot of emotions today. The main one was trying to find a moment on the hill where I could just smile because I just wanted to feel my skis take me down the hill, and I did. And I've gotten to know Michaela quite well over the last few years because she's a, she was at Burke for a long time, and I know her folks. And she's an amazing case of somebody who, interestingly enough, she's a very good athlete, but she's not a great, great athlete. She's not a physically imposing girl. And remarkably, she almost never is out of balance. How many of you have seen her race some? You rarely see her even get out of balance, much less make, make mistakes. And she's always been that way. I saw her training when she was 13 years old. She was always rock solid. She's incredibly consistent in her mind, in her emotions, in all ways. So, starting to wrap it, up, wrap it all up, what's it like to experience prime ski race? Let me describe some of the qualities. First of all, it's automatic and effortless. I don't believe racers need to, should try on race day. Because try means sort of taking control and having the mind work. On race day, it's about letting the body do what it knows how to do. Trusting the body that if, if your kids allow it, their body will go down the hill as fast as it can. So it's, all, it, it's effortless. Um, heightened senses. Um, you hear for like Andre Agassi or some of the, like Roger Federer will talk about how um, you know, when he's totally on, on his game, he feels like the ball is this big and it's going 10 miles an hour. And obviously it's not, but our senses in that zone are so sharpened that it makes the ball look bigger, or the, or the, the ball look bigger, and it seems to be slowing down because we're processing it so quickly. Uh, natural focus. Going back to the idea of try. The, the, your kids aren't trying to focus. They're simply there. They simply have that focus. It's, it's natural. Uh, boundless energy. Fatigue at the end of the run? No, not an issue. When they're in that zone, when they're experiencing prime ski racing, they have so much energy, and fatigue is just not an issue. Finally, all is one. A lot of racers will think, well, there's the mental, there's the physical, there's the technical, there's the, the tactical. But when, when kids experience prime ski racing, it all comes together. And think, think of it as a funnel, that all these things come in to the top of the funnel, and what comes out is great ski racing. And by the way, you don't have to be a World Cup skier to experience prime ski racing. All you need to do is whatever level you're at, have the capacity to ski as well as you possibly can. So achieving prime ski racing. Obviously, I'm, I'm emphasizing the mental side of ski racing. But to experience prime ski racing, you need to have all those components present at the highest level. So for example, physical health, well-conditioned, rested, eating well, injury and illness free. Um, best, best equipment ideally prepared. I'll often ask racers on a training day, did you prepare your equipment last night? Well, no, I didn't feel like it. Well, um, how, to, how well tuned are they? Well, not very. Well, how well are you going to be able to ski and get, out, get quality training out of today? And they go, well, I, need, I need to go to my skis. Um, having the necessary skills. Obviously, can't ski the fastest if they don't have the capabilities to get down the hill. And that's why, obviously, technique and tactics are so important. <clears throat> and lastly, of course, is the prime ski racing pyramid. They need motivated, confident, ideal intensity, great focus, and good emotions. So where does that all? Oh, there's Michaela. So Michaela says, it was one of those things when everything was a blur. And that's how you know it is good. So for her, when she can't remember the course, she knows she's skiing well because there's no thought. It's just her body's just in, in, in autopilot and just doing what it knows how to do, which is obviously skiing <coughs> incredibly fast. So what's the payoff? 
your kids can develop these areas in the prime ski racing pyramid, what they get is victory, however they might de define it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. Questions? Can we, do we have time for that? Yeah, we do. We've got, okay. we've got time. Okay, good. Questions, comments about that? Anything I've said? Did you have any regret? In my ski racing career? Yeah. I didn't, because um, when I first got to Burke, um, I was four foot nine, 89 pounds. My coach uh, uh, years later said, Jim, if, we, if you made the Vermont State Championship, we thought you'd have a heck of a career. And I How ended up you? when I got to Burke. At that height and weight. Oh, 13. Yeah. And now I'm this beast, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, what are you guys laughing at? <laughs> Um, so, you know, I look back and I, I made it as far as I could. The only thing, I blame my parents because they didn't give me good enough genes, but I, I, worked through, I sort of worked through that. Um, but no, um, I, I think I, I couldn't have made it any farther. I, so yeah, that's all I can say to that. Other questions? Going once? Yes. Okay, there's a self-perpetuating attitude. I have a son who speed races for Dartmouth. Mm. So we started skiing out this year. So every start was, I'm going to do that, I'm going to ski out anyway, so why be here? Right. So yes, yeah, so we did. We skied out, we skied out, and if you made it down, it was a miracle, because he was convinced he was going to ski out. Right. How do you stop that? How do you stop that, that machine in motion? Right. It's hard. You get, you get that momentum in your brain, and it's hard to turn it around. Um, one thread things through quality training. Um, two, um, through imagery, because that's one place where ideally you can see yourself skiing well and finishing, and, and the imagery is so powerful, and the research shows that imagery is not just picturing things in your head, it actually fools your body and your mind into thinking you're actually doing it. And so, so you can see yourself skiing well, skiing fast and finishing in your mind, which then translate hopefully out onto the hill. Um, I, it might be that there were some technical problems. I'd explore what's going on technically or tactically with him. Maybe he just needs to back off to 90% and just ski some clean runs. And um, and uh, I guess that's that's all. Those are the main things I can think of at this point. But it also recognizing I need to turn this around. This is not a good situation. I think another thing that can happen, especially in college skiing, they become really outcome focused. Last year I worked with a, a couple of uh, top 95s from back east. Both of them. Um, they were, had, were so focused on results and qualifying for Junior Worlds that um, uh, that they uh, they, fit, they DNF like nine out of ten races. And then they called me, and not like I'm some magician, but I simply got them to focus on the process. Okay, you know, forget that, forget all that other stuff. Just think about what do you need to do to ski fast. And, they, they, and I'm, I usually don't have these kind of turnarounds, but both of them just automatically instantly turn around and start having great races because they changed their perspective, they changed their focus, and it made a huge difference. Yes? Uh, how many athletes do you personally work with in a year, and how do you determine who you work with? Um, it depends. At any given time, individually, I work with maybe half a dozen athletes. And sometimes it's in my office um, in San Francisco. So, uh, I do a lot of work with Skype. Um, usually, th there are three or four kids uh, that I work with on a regular basis on snow, for example. Like this summer, I'm going to be in, in Hood in, a, in June with one athlete, and then I'm going to be in um, Switzerland and um, New Zealand with another athlete, and then um, in Chile with another one. Um, we're also, well, where I'll go on snow with them for three to five days and work on all this stuff and build in these skills, and then, and then periodically throughout the rest of the year. So it, it depends on how do I choose. Um, partially, um, are they really good? Um, and partially, but not always. Partially, uh, do, uh, do I feel like I can help them? Um, partially, I think it'd be fun, and um, you know, money's in there a little bit, but um, that's. But that, 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 you do that for free? Well, I, no, I don't do it for free. But but um, I'm by no means a wealthy man, but um, but I earn a nice living, so I'm in a place where I can choose who I want to work with, and so um, so if I just think it'd be fun and interesting, because there's this one kid from LA um, who I'm going to start working with, who's not a really good skier, but he's just really smart and motivated and interesting, and um, I think I can help, and so uh, so that's my situation. Yeah. So, ski racing is kind of unique because it's one athlete at a time, close course duration, you know, a minute or two minutes. What do you <coughs> say when you work with athletes? I'm thinking more of, of, of cycling, mm -hmm. bike races, where they might have races that go for, you know, two to five hours and competitors side by side. 
and, and stuff. Because some ski racers have gone on to be very successful in in cycling. Right. Right. So how does uh, these sort of uh, tech? You know, yeah. Yeah, I, I do a ton of, because of my endurance sport background, I do a ton of work with cyclists and triathletes and runners. And um, all these things translate. It's just having to apply them to the fact that you might be out there for five, six, or in the case of an Ironman, 12 to 15 hours, 17 hours. Yeah. Um, but also, in, my, um, in the top of my pyramid for endurance sports is pain. Yeah. And the ability to manage pain is the ultimate determinant of, of an endurance athlete being able to perform at the, at the highest level. And so it's a matter of taking these concepts and simply applying them to the specific needs of the sport, where it's not just a minute or two keeping it together. It's that, you know, you know like, you know, 100-mile bike race, you can't stay totally focused the entire race. Yeah. So it's a matter of knowing when to do that. So on, on the flats, you just fall back, and or if you have to attack, you have to regain focus and intensity there. On hill climbs, tremendous ability to focus, not only physiologically on yourself, because you have to really monitor, can, can I maintain this pace up this 10% grade for six miles? Or, uh, but also, can I keep up with this guy who's trying to make another break, mini breakaway? Yeah. And, or do I drop back and maintain and then attack later? Descending, obviously, is, a, is this like downhill skiing? And there's obviously fear and speed and line. So there's all these things, but it, the, 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 all the things that are here, you have to sort of apportion out over a longer period. Yeah. So do you say with, with athletes, uh, you know, <laughs> taking those, those long bike races where it's okay to let your mind wander. Yes. As long as your legs are going, and right. your, your cadence is good. You can absolutely go and yeah, and have, uh, have a mental break. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was watching the the, um, the, the tour of Italy, the um, Giro d'Italia, the last couple of days. And if you watch the the long stages in the flats, you know, they're just chatting away with with, with guys next to them, other other teams. And so because there's not a lot of need to focus. You have to pay attention. To, but those guys are such pros in riding a peloton that, that you don't see that those kind of crashes very often. But yeah, there are times you need to turn off and times you need to turn on because we're physiologically incapable of maintaining that level of focus and intensity for that long. We just, we just run out of gas. So you need to save, to save your energy. Other questions? Yes? Any, any uh, tips we've been talking about in the race and we were talking about the parents before? Um, when you get in the situation where you've got the overzealous parent and you might have a potentially good athlete, but you try to pre prevent the burnout. Like, and, and how this parent might be... The word elitism has come into our community, which we don't like, uh -huh. um, and it's doing a lot of damage. Like, right. So, so the question is, um, if you have a parent who's a little bit overly invested, a little overzealous, and how, as a coach, you can you can learn to manage them. And I think the the best thing, first of all, I say that probably ninety seven percent of parents are well intentioned and want what's best for their kids, but a lot of parents um, are a uninformed and be misguided, and a few are mentally ill. But, <laughs> and, I, and I've worked with some of them, but, um, but I think the best thing to do is education. Because there's no manual, just like there's no manual on how to raise kids, there's also no manual on how to raise athletes. And so I think it, it, in the coaching programs can do themselves a massive service by having um, parent sport parent training at the beginning of the year, which lays out what parents can do and what they shouldn't do, and I've, you're going to be getting a do's and don'ts handout. It's in this book. Oh, it's in the book. So you see some do's and don'ts of, of what, what they can do and what they shouldn't do. And so if, i found that if, if you tell parents what the right thing to do is and what the wrong thing to do is, most are going to adhere to it because they want what's best for their kids. And for the ones that are just off, off the charts um, or maybe a little overzealous, um, when they act in certain ways that are inappropriate, well, then you pull them aside and beat the heck out of them. No. No. I didn't get a laugh out of that one. <laughs> you pull them aside and maybe say, look, you know, here's some concerns. And then the ones who, there's, there's always going to be a few who just aren't going to listen to you. And then you just feel sorry for the kid and do the best you can to give the kid a healthier perspective on things. Yes? I'm just curious, uh, you said you work with Michaela Schiffen. And her parents, I understand, they're quite involved. Yes. And I know uh, the Schiffen family really well, and I know they are very involved. Yeah. And uh, so is... Uh, Here's your father, son, very uh, participated in the whole thing all along. Yeah. So, you know, that would actually suggest that what we just said, the parents should be involved as much, that, you know, there is some, there is some conflict. There. Right, there Obviously. is. And um, I, I think the best measure of how involved a parent should be is how the kid reacts. And at some point, typically, kids will communicate to their parents that, that it's, you know, I need to take, do this myself, and you need to back away. And um, I mean, you think about um, Girardelli and his father. You know, they didn't—they had a lot of conflict, from what I understand. And they, they hadn't gotten along. 
um, Lindsay, Vaughn, and her father, uh, I guess they passed things up, but they were estranged for a very long time because he was a maniac. Yeah, I saw Girardelli and his dad the whole, my whole career. <coughs> okay. And as, as far as Eileen, the, um, Jeff Schifrin is, is, you know, he's a surgeon and he sort of does his own thing. Um, he's not that involved, but Eileen travels with her everywhere. They're out at Mammoth right now. And uh, at some point, she's going to need to let go. Because, you know, Michaela, she's now just turned 18. She's young. And she's in, a, she's in a world with a lot of older athletes. And I think she does probably need some guidance because she, she comes across as being really mature. And, and by the way, I don't want to work with Michaela, so I don't want you to think I'm divulging anything um, um, in terms of confidentiality. But um, she comes across as sort of pretty together. But she's really relatively not mature yet. And she, she's very young in a lot of ways. And so she needs a fair amount of guidance. Um, but I'm going to guess at some point in the next couple of years, um, her mom is going to need to let her go. And that could be a real challenge because Eileen is very involved, for sure. Um, but ultimately, I can't say whether at what point or whether parents should be involved with their kids or how much. But I, I do know there's a point at which they're going to need to say, OK, it's time to just hand over my kid or let them do their own thing. <clears throat> Other questions? No? OK. Um, I've got a good one. Oh, um, good. <laughs> He's got confidence. Motivation <laughs> is everything. Yes. And, and I, I believe that too. Right? Um, what are the key, the, the, the killer motivation and, and the, the, the maker of motivation for these, these little kids who seem to, you, you know little kids, 10, 12 years old through 14, they can get sidetracked. Yes, man, they can, oh, skiing is great, oh, man, it, it's boring, or archery is great, next week, oh, I do basketball. Right, yeah. You know, that's one of those big questions, and there have been a couple of big books written about, actually a lot of books trying to get at what motivates people and what motivates kids. And part of it, I think, kids, some kids are just wired that way. Like, you see kids who are five years old just way into this one thing, like skiing or, or baseball or whatever it is. And, you know, that's just the way it is. I think another thing is just the experience they have. If it's fun, if it's interesting, if it's engaging, then they're going to want to do more of it. And ultimately, unfortunately, what happens though when kids head toward adolescence, they're pulled in a lot of different ways, and then the hormones start coming in, and that starts m messing up the mix. And so, and plus, you know, they're getting pulled socially, popular culture saying things, time is taken away from other things that they like. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those great questions that I indicated earlier that motivation was one of the hardest things to address. Um, ultimately, it's a matter of getting down to what are your goals, why do you do it, and okay, so it's hard and you're having to make some sacrifices, some tough choices, but how important is, it, is this to you? And it, yeah. yeah. Peer groups and their buddies, I guess, is probably the biggest yeah. little motivator yeah. right there. Oh, yeah, peer, peer groups. Peer. I mean, if you can create your, peer, your kids' main <clears throat> peer groups with their skier, ski team, then they're going to want to be a part of that. But it's a big challenge where usually in early adolescence they want to be hanging at home on weekends because that's where their friends are, missing out on all the fun. And, and that's a challenge. Do you find in your, in your business and in your, with your job actually, <clears throat> did you see a little bit of lack of motivation or lack of within the, God I shouldn't say, the wealthy families, right? Because let's face it, this is a sport where there's a lot of wealthy. Yeah. Families. So the question is, does the wealthy kids are they less motivated? Correct. Um, and I just remember, I, right. it's because I I, um, I coach with um, uh, Susan Clifford, mm -hmm. Susan Clifford, Betsy Clifford. Yeah, they're they're sort of a, a legendary sport family, a little bit like the Athens. Uh, mm -hmm. And and she made a thesis psycho uh, sports psychology in the University of Ottawa, mm -hmm. and her big quote was. Give me a bunch of kids from the Bronx, and I'll make a bunch of little cup ski races, yeah. peanuts. So, so the question is, is wealth, can that interfere with drive to, su to succeed? And I would say potentially. <laughs> Certainly need is a great motivator. So for, a, for an inner kid from the inner city, the only way they're getting out is to make a, get a college scholarship and play basketball in the NBA. Uh, a, a kid growing up in the, the Austrian Alps, a small town in the Alps, the only way they're getting out of that town potentially to not be uh, managing their parents' pension or being a ski instructor, is to make it on the World Cup. For, for kids in ski race in the U.S. or in Canada, um, it, that's, there's not that need. But, but for me, money's never the issue. For me, the issue is, are the values and the connection that kids have. I'm a kid from Vail whose father is just ungodly wealthy, and um, he's unbelievably motivated. But what is interesting, and I've seen this with several kids, is that many of these wealthy, usually fathers, um, they... Uh, 
they take ownership of the kid's ski race. And so then the kid loses the motivation. But in this particular case, when they got a new coach, and he's privately coached, of course, and he, um, he, uh, the coach said, look, Dad, you need to back away. And if he's going to do this, he needs to want to do it himself. And so the dad backs away, the kid gains ownership, and he finds a deep connection with it, and he works unbelievably hard. So needing is one thing, but wanting really badly, it's, it's still very possible. It depends on the environment, the family environment the kids are brought up in. Other questions? Okay, so um, wrapping up again, um, you can sign up for my um, e-newsletter here uh, or online. Um, you can get my book online. It goes through all these things that I've talked about and many more. Um, I'll have to be here have, having lunch with you guys uh, and answer individual questions. If I, if I can be of any assistance in, um, informally with an email question or more formally in speaking at your clubs or working with your kids, feel free to reach out to me. Again, I want to thank um, John and Bruce and um, Gordy and Justine for the great effort in bringing me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great.